Okay, today we're going to be talking about another benthic environment that's in uh, fairly shallow waters, although uh, deeper than what we saw for the rocky uh, shore and intertidal pools. Uh, so for most of today's lecture, um, I took it from chapter 13 in the Leventon textbook. So um, yes, as I said, we're moving up the, uh, the, uh, the uh, benthic environment to much shallower waters. Um, probably about less than 50 meters, 100 meters or so, but not quite as shallow as the intertidal pools that we talked about already on Tuesday. Um, so here's just another uh, diagram showing that uh, gradient in benthic environments ranging from the deepest ocean, of course, and to the shelf. And for the most part, we're talking about um, environments that we see on the shelf in shallower waters. Uh, I'll go back and forth between, between talking about benthic zones um, and the benthos. Benthos, of course, being the noun, um, meaning the same thing as benthic zone. So why should we know about these, these organisms and, and this environment? Um, lots of reasons. One is, if, even if you didn't care about invertebrates themselves, um, we're going to be focusing mainly on invertebrates uh, today. Um, they are food for organisms that you may care about, that is fish, um, uh, in particular ground fish that feed off of the, on these organisms. Um, they're also food for uh, birds, um, such as the uh, uh, red knot, which is a migrating bird that we see very uh, common here in, uh, in the Delaware estuary. And when we talk about estuaries, I'll get more into that uh, topic and about the importance of, of our estuary in, in supporting these migrating birds. Um, these shallow uh, environments are also important biogeochemical cycles. Just to say a few words about that um, in a minute. And then as always, um, if we are interested in general about the evolution of organisms, we need to look at um, marine ones, and that includes many of those that live in shallow benthic environments. Um, so in talking about these, these environments, it's important to look at the sediment and the, the qualities of that sediment. It varies quite a bit um, from very uh, coarse material, not quite boulders, um, but uh, uh, certainly coarser material and, uh, versus uh, clay and other uh, very small particles. Um, that has a big impact on what organisms are present. Um, and basically, uh, the, uh, the uh, sediment uh, characteristics um, depend on the currents. So basically, if you have very strong, fast currents, um, only big things are going to be able to um, stay in that uh, benthic environment, that place. Um, that would be more like gravel. Of course, and then uh, the other extreme is very uh, slow currents, weak currents. Um, uh, many other things can settle down and and uh, and build up in that place, um, so it'd be more like mud. Um, and also ter tends out be ter uh, turns out to be more organic rich than what we see um, with gravel. And so uh, we can divide these uh, sediments into two basic types. Um, really uh, technical here soft and hard bottoms. And for most part, today we're going to be talking about soft bottoms. And these places are, for, for the most part, uh, rather organic rich. Um, it's kind of uh, implied by this poor guy uh, going through uh, this mud bath. I think it's some training exercise or some race uh, that uh, involved going through mud. Anyway, um, what's really um, characteristic of these soft bottoms is the fact that they are basically a very uh, uh, simply two zones. One, a, a very thin layer of oxic sediments, um, that is oxygen-rich sediments, um, above a much th uh, deeper layer of uh, potentially very oxygen-poor, um, even uh, no oxygen, that is anoxic uh, sediments underneath that thin layer. Um, so the graph on the, on the left kind of illustrates that a little bit, shows the buildup of hydrogen sulfide which is a poison for most organisms. That's the result of sulfate reduction, the, uh, the type of metabolism that bacteria carry out, and they produce hydrogen sulfide. Um, and that hydrogen sulfide um, is, can be really high and deep down in the sediment core, um, but then as it reaches near the surface, it, it, it uh, goes down to zero. Oxygen does the opposite, goes from very um, high concentrations in the surface to very low. Uh, concentration, sometimes quite quickly um, in the sediment uh, profile. So that's illustrated perhaps I think a little bit more clearly 
on the right here so you can see again oxygen disappearing we can see within just uh, millimeters less than a centimeter less than a few inches uh, much less than an inch um, and there's no oxygen at all um, and you see the decrease in sulfate and what's happening here is that the sulfate is being re um, uh, reduced down to hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen sulfide as I mentioned is a poison that a lot of organisms have a lot of problems dealing with so that's one uh, main characteristic of these soft bottom sediments is, is this two-layered system oxic sediments on top um, and oxic sediments um, underneath so why is oxygen used up um, in the top layer um, for one thing is that these environments um, see a lot of organic material so the flux or the supply of that organic material mainly in the form of detritus um, is is quite high and so that's that's um, that's the case when the water is shallow um, less than 50 meters um, and also you have to have high rates of prime production and generally often during uh, close to the coast in shallow waters um, uh, like this you can you can see uh, high prime production so you need to have both now the other part of the equa uh, the equation is is that the uh, diffusion of oxygen into these sediments is just not enough to keep up with the supply of the organic material so there's more organic material going into that into that sediment and that organic material is degraded by the bacteria mineralized by the bacteria for the most part and that uses up all the oxygen it uses up the oxygen faster than diffusion can replace it so that's why you get to the uh, the uh, lot the, uh, uh, the lack of oxygen um, below a few millimeters um, in the sediment core so when you don't have oxygen basically it you the uh, the the life there is dominated by small organisms mainly bacteria archaea there's a few single cell eukaryotes proteus that are able to um, uh, uh, survive there um, later when we talk about dead zones which is a problem that we see in coastal waters we'll see that there are some um, large organisms metazoans that are, are, are able to withstand the lack of oxygen for um, limited amount of times limited amount of time but that's for the most part the exception rather than the rule for the most part only or organisms that are very small bacteria archaea and a few pr proteus are able to survive without oxygen um, so the, the types of anaerobic metabolisms that is uh, metabolisms without oxygen include fermentation um, um, and that um, you actually enjoy um, uh, if you know, for example I have yogurt with my cereals so if that's a yogurt is a product of a fermentation ethanol um, not with my cereal necessarily most days um, is a, a, a fermentation uh, byproduct and there are many other ones um, I mentioned already sulfate reduction sulfate reduction is carried out uh, only by bacteria and archaea and it produces this uh, toxic gas that's uh, toxic to many higher organisms um, and then finally methanogenesis is, is the, uh, the synthesis of methane um, that's done only by archaea so here's another diagram showing the the layering of these these uh, um, organisms uh, and, and at the top we have the aerobic bacteria and other organisms that, are, uh, that use oxygen then we have the fermenting bacteria uh, finally the sulfate reducers and then the methanogenic um, but that's a maximum mistake the textbook Lemton's uh, uh, textbook has uh, bacteria and that those are, that's only done by archaea and that's seen only down deep in the sediments so uh, um, and again we see this two-layered system with oxygen a lot of oxygen here and and below oxygen below that uh, oxic layer there's no oxygen at all so that's sometimes called the redox potential discontinuity at least that's what one of them calls it I don't I really don't use that term that that important for you to remember what is important for you to know is that there's in these soft sediment um, uh, habitats the uh, only a top layer of those sediments has lots of oxygen the rest does not now the exception to that is um, is what benthic organisms can do to those sediments and that um, plays into uh, the uh, importance of these uh, these organisms in terms of element cycles um, and so really in terms of biogeochemistry and the carbon cycle um, in particular the role of benthic organisms is basically to break up the detritus um, and we'll talk quite a bit about detritus and, and I'll give a bit more precise definition of what that is in a minute but uh, suffice it to say for now it's a it's non-living organic material so what these benthic invertebrates do is that they break it up 
and that carries uh, breaks uh, creates more surface area for microbes to do the hard work in terms of, of mineralize it back to the inorganic constituents like CO2, ammonium, and phosphate. The other uh, main role of these benthic invertebrates is to um, mix up the, the uh, sediments. And, and the word that's used to describe that, and that mixing up is bioturbation. And basically that allows oxygen to get down to what otherwise would be just um, oxygen free or anoxic mud. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so what, the, what the invertebrates are doing basically uh, is that they're feeding on this detritus, this non-living organic material, and uh, we'll, we'll see later um, in class, I'll show, the, show you the picture or video of, of what this sea cucumber is doing there. Um, I, maybe you can get an idea what it is doing. Um, but anyway, we'll get into that a bit more. But suffice it to say that these deposit feeders, and we'll see in a, bit, uh, in a bit what those are, are eating the detritus, and, and they are also eating the bacteria. And in the process of doing that, the bacteria then release the inorganic constituents of that detritus, turning that organic material back into its inorganic constituents, CO2, uh, phosphate, and ammonium. And of course, that can be uh, then released back up into the water column and fueling prime production that we see um, in the water column. What the deposit feeders are doing basically is they're making smaller bits of detritus and creating more surface area for bacteria to do their job. Now, the other role of these benthic invertebrates, as I mentioned, is to stir things up to bioturbation, um, to carry out bioturbation. And basically, this nice pretty picture of oxygen disappearing within millimeters and the sulfate disappearing like that, and nitrate also disappearing, you really only see that when you don't have any animals mucking things up. So what the animals do is basically they, they do this, as I mentioned, bioturbation. They basically bur 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 burrow into the sediments and create um, little channels and mix things up, allowing oxygen to uh, oxygen rich water to get into the mud that otherwise would not be able to get there. That's a much faster way of get oxygen down into sediments than, than simple diffusion. So that's one reason why to have um, these organisms around in these benthic environments is to, to put more oxygen into the sediments, um, which helps um, all organisms and helps actually degradation of that material. And then also they break up the detritus to make smaller particles, creating more surface area for bacteria to do its work. So let's now look at some of these organisms that we see in these, these habitats. And basically um, there aren't any new ones. Um, there are a few new ones perhaps. Um, but you've seen many of the names already. Here's an amphipod. That's one of the words, uh, genus names or, or, or types of organisms that I want you to remember. But we'll, we'll get into a few other ones. But I don't think you'll, we'll, there'll be any surprises. And, and just as we've seen already for starting with the zooplankton and then uh, other invertebrates um, down in the deep benthos, we can divide up these shallow uh, benthic in, invertebrates by phylogeny. That is just their taxonomic name. And of course, we can divide up them up by size. Um, and we'll see in a moment, we can divide them up by other ways, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so size, let's, uh, I think in the past, I've started with the biggest and gone down to the smallest. Let's start with the smallest and go up to the biggest. Um, microphonic includes all sorts of small organisms um, that uh, you've all seen before. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I put bacteria and archaea here, but, but you know, they aren't really, uh, um, fauna at all. Uh, but certainly these copepods, other crustaceans, ciliates, and so on are important members of this microfauna. Uh, myofauna, again, a word that you should know already. Uh, these are uh, 0.1 to 0.5 millimeters in length. Um, they have this characteristic of being uh, worm-like, even though they're not really worm. They have a worm-like shape, um, uh, including the polychaetes. That's a, a, a a word that I want you to know, the herpacticoid copepods. Um, you know, again, this one even looks less like than the copepods we saw in the water column, uh, but that's a, that's a herpacticoid copepods or those copepods that we see in the benthic environments as opposed to the, um, to the water column and so on. So all these organisms have in common is that they have this worm-like shape, which helps them kind of get in between the cracks of, of the uh, mud and clays that we see in this environment. 
Macrofauna, um, of course, these are bigger organisms. Um, rather than giving you a list of the um, uh, of organisms that I want you to remember, I thought we'll just take a little break. And um, I'm going like to show you a few pictures from a trip I went on last spring to China. And we saw lots of, my wife and I saw lots of things that were eaten there on the street. Um, most of these pictures, I think, are from Beijing. Uh, uh, some of them are also from uh, Qingdao, uh, Qingdao, and uh, Xiamen. Xiamen, was, uh, we went through all three of, three of those places. But Xiamen is is a uh, city located on the coast of uh, China, um, and it's the university there has a um, cooperative agreement with the University of Delaware, which was one of the reasons why I went to Xiamen. So anyway, um, uh, you. Probably even I have eaten calamari. That's of course the Italian word for for squid, um, but a little bit more exotic that maybe you haven't eaten that I didn't eat. It's binoculars or they're peanut worms. Um, they are are um, uh, some folks put them in an annelid phylum, but uh, others put them into their own uh, phyla. Uh, and then you have the sea cucumbers. I mentioned about um, having those. I didn't have them on this trip, but. On another trip to Hong Kong, I did have a, a sea cucumber, and and I mentioned the fact that I like you to remember holotherians as there is a class that has the sea, sea, cucum sea cucumbers. And then finally, uh, not so finally, I guess I have one more picture: starfish or sea stars. Um, these are echinoderms. Um, that is a word that you should know. Uh, and then. This is the final picture, the most bizarre, not very marine, but couldn't resist showing scorpions. Um, and what's not shown in this picture is the fact that these scorpions were still alive. They're still kind of wiggling around on those sticks there. And I have to say, I don't think I saw anyone actually um, uh, buy them. Um, what they would do is they would cook them up right there um, on the street. And I, I don't know what I suspect all of you had was just kind of chunky, uh, uh, crunchy, crunchy, feeling or whatever in your mouth from the from the uh, chitin exoskeleton um i i didn't quite know I, when i was looking at the taxonomy of the scorpions is that they are actually in the same class as uh, spiders and arachnids anyway so those are some of the organisms that that we that that we see not uh not scorpions in shallow benthic environments but some of the other ones that we see there um, another way to divide up these these invertebrates is by where they live um, and, uh, and the two words there that you need to know are epifaunal or epibenthic, which means on the surface, or infaunal, which means in the sediments. Um, and not that hard to, to picture. Um, basically, a lot of organisms are, again, just living on top of the surface. Here's a you know, gastropod, various number of bivalves. And then, perhaps um, a bit more surprising, are these infaunal organisms that live within the sediments and that would include things like the polychaete here or again the amphipod um, you know, that shrimp-like um, crustacean that i asked you to remember so uh so you know it kind of raises the question why why go down into the sediments where you know there is a danger of, of encountering hydrogen sulfide which is a, a poison um, and why get down into the mud? And also, you know, there's there's chance of less oxygen down there. Um, so why do that? Um, why do you think they do it? Well, there's probably two answers. One is that they probably get more food. Um, they may go after some of the microbes that are down there, other invertebrates perhaps. Um, detritus that's been buried there. And then another answer I think is to get away from organisms that don't burrow. To get away from predators, um, you know, remember those fish that uh, may be feeding on them, other invertebrates that may go in after them. Okay, so so that's how another way we can group these organisms by where they live: epifaunal on top of the sediment surface, infaunal within sediment surface that they they actually burrow into the sediment. And then another way we can divide up these organisms is by how they get their feed, how they get their food. Um, and we'll go now through these three types of uh, feeding mechanisms. First, um, deposit feeding. Well, deposit, you know, what's, what's that word? Deposit here just refers to the fact that these organisms are on the bottom, in the benthic uh, zone, in the benthos, and they're feeding on what's ever being deposited on them from the surface. Again, remember, 
uh, that for the most part, the, the food that they get is from uh, prime production that's occurring in the surface waters. Now, there are some shallow um, waters that are shallow enough to get enough light to support um, in situ prime production, that is, prime production by benthic algae that are on the sediments themselves. But for the most part, these invertebrates are depending on things that are being deposited, the detritus that's being deposited on them. So that's, that's the word deposit feeding is what's used to describe these organisms. So there's two types, basically. One, those that are picky and basically in, uh, pick out individual food particles. Um, here are some examples of mud shrimp, kind of an ugly looking organism, uh, probably not eaten very much. Um, and then uh, the one that you may have seen around on, on the shore is the filler crab. And you can just kind of picture this, you know, this organism feeding with that, uh, the, uh, those pincers, although I, I suspect that's more in um, defense mechanism that rather than getting food. So anyway, they're just picking things out of the sediments. Um, so another, uh, uh, another uh, uh, a mode of deposit feeding, feeding um, are those that do not have any selectivity. They're just, you know, shoving things in their mouth and eating everything that they can and ingesting only what they, of course, are, are able to, to uh, rather, let me take that back. They're ingesting everything they can, but then they digest only that, those uh, parts of the things that they're ingesting that are, they can degrade and break down in use. So they're, they're getting everything, sediments, detritus. So it's, I'm using the word sediments now here to, to talk about the inorganic constituents. Um, they, they're taking that in, they're taking the detritus in, um, they're taking in microbes that may be on the detritus or microbes that are just living free of the detritus. And so one example of that is a sea cucumber and I'm gonna show in class this movie or you can see it yourself. It's kind of funny, I like it. Um, um, you can see if you wanna do this at home, how you would cook up a, a sea cucumber. Um, so, uh, so that's one example of non-selected um, de deposit feeding. So, so we've, I've been using this word detritus, and so let's spend a, a little bit of time making sure that you know what that word means. Not a really complicated word, but it's a really important part of, of what's happening down here. And I think it's one thing that's really different from perhaps our everyday experience of thinking about um, um, larger organisms um, on, in terrestrial environments. Um, these invertebrates are eating things that are not alive. That's the main very simple definition of detritus is non-living organic material and it can range from things that are just basically not that long dead freshly deposited uh, plankton to much older things that are would be probably pretty hard to degrade um, it has lots of cellulose for example and if it's if it's near uh, land it may even have terrestrial uh, it may even have a uh, 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 lignin cellulose which makes up wood and, and if you think about it, um, uh, we're, we're talking here about detritus feeders, those organisms that feed on detritus. And if you think about it for a bit, uh, you probably never thought of yourself as a detritus feeder, but in fact, that's what you are. Now, hopefully you're feeding on things that are fairly freshly deposited on your dinner plate that have high food quality, but um, with few exceptions, uh, you're living and eating non-living organic material, right? You cooked it. Um, or even a salad is pretty dead. Now, if you talk about things like yogurt, you know, yogurt actually is quite quite alive with microbes. A little bit, you know, I don't want to think about that too much actually. Um, but that's probably the only exception. Otherwise, you're living on detritus, things that's not living. And that's the case with these organisms. So, but the thing is with these organisms, you remember, especially the ones that are just kind of eating everything that they encounter, what are they really, are they really eating? Um, and, and the question really is, what are they eating? The, the detritus itself, the dead plant material, or is it the stuff growing on it? The bacteria and other things are growing on it. Um, and, and the, and the, uh, the uh, dilemma that faces these organisms is that the detritus is, there's usually a lot more of it, um, but often it's, it's not as good stuff. Remember, these micro bacteria and other small organisms are really kind of protein rich. They don't have any structural material. They don't have cellulose. They don't have lignin cellulose. And so they're really packets of protein. Um, whereas detritus um, 
is not that. Often detritus, the reason why it's round at all, it has a bit more stru structural material, cellulose. And again, if it's near land, it has lignin cellulose, the wood. Um, so it's not as, as high quality, not as high uh, amounts of uh, protein. Um, but there's a lot more of it, a lot more of it. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, microbes, uh, bacteria and other microbes, um, are little protein nuggets, uh, but there's not a lot of it. So what do you want to go for, quality or, or quantity? Um, and it's sometimes called the crackers or, or peanut butter analogy. Um, and if you think about it, I don't know if you eat peanut butter and the crackers, um, but one way to eat them is basically you're, you know, you're just kind of using the crackers to carry the peanut butter. Um, actually, I'm not sure why you know these these deposit feeding biologists uh, settled on this analogy maybe a better analogy would be cheese and, and crackers i mean crackers um, are just serving in, at least in my case as a vehicle to carry the cheese to my my mouth I don't really care that much about the crackers i'm more interested in the cheese and so anyway so in this case it's been called the crackers or peanut butter problem you know are you going after the crackers which basically is there's no protein at all in crackers. It's just a you know, dry, boring thing to carry the peanut butter, which has the protein and a bit of fat too also. So how do you answer that? Um, well, one thing you do is you can grow these organisms in the lab. Some of you can grow in the lab, or at least keep in the lab long enough to see what they, they, um, they eat um, and see which one grows better on, uh, whether it grows better on detritus or microbes. Um, another way to answer this question is you look at their guts. Um, so anyway, the backup, the, the problem with the growth experiments is sometimes it's hard to get them to live in the lab to do that experiment. Hard to, uh, uh, you know, get the right detritus uh, and, and, and to uh, do an experiment that really mimics what happens in nature. So that's not a perfect way. Um, another way is you look at what's in their guts. This is um, a, a, a very common approach to looking at what animals feed on is you just basically open them up or somehow get their guts and look at that. Now, immediately you probably recognize or, or would, if you thought about it long enough, you realize that uh, by the time it reaches a, uh, an animal's gut, um, it may have lost any shape at all of what's actually, you know, what was the original food. So that's not a great, great way of doing it. Um, and then some other ways are a bit more sophisticated, um, and we'll spend a bit more time on that. Um, one is to use the natural abundance of N15 and C13. These are just naturally occurring isotopes that we see in the possible food for these organisms, and there's ways in which you can deduce what they're eating from the uh, natural abundance of these two isotopes. I'm not going to say anything more about that. I want to say a bit more about experiments. Now, this is this is where what you, you are what you're doing is you're labeling up food with these isotopes. These are two stable isotopes. They're not radioactive. C14 is a radioactive isotope of, of carbon. So basically what you do is you feed, I'll, I'll just stick to the stable um, isotopes. You feed um, uh, to plants or algae in order to make the detritus, either N15 ammonium or C13 uh, carbon dioxide. And so then you're making that detritus from plants or, or algae. Um, that's now labeled with those stable isotopes. And then you do that also for the microbes. And then you feed that now labeled food back to the deposit feeders and look for the label in the animal. So the advantage of this, you can do this in a relatively short term experiment. You can do it um, uh, in conditions that perhaps mimic more closely to the natural environment of that animal as opposed to the lab. Um, uh, it has its drawbacks, um, but is a very powerful approach for looking at this question. And the answer is, well, as you may guess, it depends. It depends on the, on the deposit feeder and it depends on the, on the detritus. Um, and I have to say, for the most part, they're getting most of their carbon from the detritus and they may be getting some of their nitrogen from the bacteria. But overall, um, it depends. Um, you know, why am I showing you this? The point here is to show you experimental technique for getting an important question um, about the metabolism and uh, 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 feeding strategy of these organisms. Okay, so you should know now what deposit feeders are and the fact that they eat detritus and associated microbes. Um, 
You should know that these invertebrates, as we've seen for all the invertebrates encountered so far, can be grouped and, and classified uh, not only by taxonomy, uh, but by size. Um, and in the case of these benthic invertebrates, you can talk about them, about where they live, epifaunal versus infaunal, and finally their feeding mode, um, one being deposit feeding. Um, and the other a point that you should know now about these soft bottom sediments. This is not really a, a, an issue with hard bottom sediments. First of all, they're hard. There's no, uh, you know, no, nothing to get into, uh, into a rock. Um, uh, but also uh, with these, with harder uh, sediments, with say gravel, um, there's just not enough organic material to use up all the oxygen. Um, and in soft bottom sediments, um, oxygen disappears um, within, uh, within a few millimeters and anaerobic metabolisms take over. Um, for the most part dominated by these microbes, bacteria and archaea, um, although there are some um, invertebrates that can survive long times without, a uh, long time without oxygen. And that's a, a, a topic we'll get into when we talk about the dead zone problem that we see in coastal waters um, around this country and also elsewhere. Okay, so we've talked about deposit feeders, and let's continue on our, our, our survey of other types of marine um, benthic invertebrates that feed by other mechanisms. And the other mechanism is, is to rely on the microbes. And these are symbiotic microbes, microbes that are occurring with, uh, living with these invertebrates and helping them survive um, uh, by using uh, compounds that the invertebrate cannot otherwise use. And so um, the, the types of symbiosis vary quite a bit. Um, it can include microbes that, that provide enzymes to degrade and hydrolyze polymers um, that are not used by the animal. This in fact happens with us as well. We have symbiotic microbes within our digestive tract that help us um, uh, 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 digest our food. And that's certainly the case with um, very, uh, several animals and invertebrates where they cannot degrade, for example, cellulose. And it's the microbes that are doing that, that hydrolysis, that breaking up of that polymer into uh, byproducts that can be used by the animal. Uh, but the example that's um, seen with these benthic invertebrates, which is really spectacular, I think, um, and really unique, and we don't see that with us, <laughs> for sure, is, is these chemolithoautotrophic bacteria that are using compounds um, that otherwise the animal cannot use. And they're getting energy from these inorganic compounds um, make, and making organic material like the uh, phytoplankton analogy that we've seen already. And, and that organic material is in turn used to feed the animal. So we'll say a few more words about that. So the full name is, and I've used it already, is chemolithoautotrophic bacteria. We're gonna see this again when we talk about hydrothermal vents uh, but I want to mention it now in this case, in this, in this um, lecture, because it, it is an important example of, of how these invertebrates uh, make a living. So, uh, so another word that's used for this is chemosynthetic. Uh, I think it's not as useful because under, uh, the word is used in this case for these chemolithotrophic bacteria, but not in this case uh, uh, where the, the microbe is just um, is, is helping as much. It's also chemosynthetic, but it's just not doing what these organisms are doing. So the word chemosynthetic is only used to describe um, these chemolithotrophic bacteria. Okay, so what's happening here is that um, is, is a use of, of this otherwise very toxic compound, hydrogen sulfide, is used as an energy source by these chemoautotrophic uh, symbionts. And it's, they're using CO2 as their carbon source and they're making organic material. They're making organic material for itself. They're making more cellular uh, material. And that cellular biomass of the bacterium then goes on to feed the invertebrate. And a spectacular example of that is tube worms that we see at hydrothermal vents. So in the third course, third, uh, uh, I think, I think, I don't think we're, I can't remember now if we talk about hydrothermal vents, this third of the course or the final third. But anyway, we will be talking about uh, hydrothermal vents um, uh, soon, and we'll see more about these um, chemosynthetic uh, symbionts that occur within the two worms at hydrothermal vents. And we'll talk a lot more about 
um, dense as an ecosystem. But, uh, but these also occur uh, much closer to home in salt marshes that are just in our backyard here, at least down here in Lewis. There are some types of clams that don't have a gut, they don't have any digestive tract, and they are uh, relying on these chemoautotrophic symbionts to again carry out this reaction of using the hydrogen sulfide that's produced by that, uh, sulfate reducers that are these hydrogen sulfide oxidizing um, organisms are fixing CO2, making again organic material, uh, more biomass for itself, and that organic material then goes on to feed these clams and other uh, vertebrates that have these chemoautotrophic symbionts in them. So that's a, a great example of, of how symbiosis is helping these organisms. And the final example is, is perhaps, I don't know, what's more bizarre, using hydrogen sulfide, a toxic gas, or methane. There's um, mussels that live on natural gas. And they live on natural gas thanks to the work that's being done by these methyltrophic bacteria. The methyltrophic bacteria are using the um, methane that's coming out of what are called cold seeps in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere, a couple places elsewhere in the world. So cold seeps um, are basically places, cracks in the Earth's crust where methane is, is getting out and other hydrocarbons. So you probably know that there's lots of uh, oil deposits in the Gulf of Mexico. That's why we have oil derricks out there to drill for oil. Um, uh, what may not be quite as obvious is that even without those oil derricks out there and, and, and drilling, um, there would be methane um, oil leaking out of the, uh, uh, the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And there's organisms that take advantage of this um, energy-rich uh, suite of compounds that are coming out. Um, it's only bacteria that can do that. And, and mussels have figured out how to, some mussels have been able to figure out how to make use of these um, bacteria in, in symbiotic relationships. So, the, so it's, the bacteria, again, are using the methane as a carbon source and as an energy source. And the bacteria are making organic material for its own bodies. And then the, that organic material then goes on to feed the mussels. And there's an example of that here. Okay, so that's that. There's a we're going to say a, a bit more about the hydrothermal vent animals, but that's um, I, all the time we have for symbiotic microbes. And we're, now we're going to go to our last form of, of feeding, and that's called suspension feeding. So suspension feeding is somewhat like filter feeding. Um, it is very much like filter feeding, but the word suspension feed, feed, feeders are, is used to describe those benthic horses as opposed to zooplankton that we talked about earlier for filter feeding. So the, the suspension feeders can be divided into two types. One that basically are, are just kind of sticking their little arms out or, or feeding the apparatus out into the currents and just relying on the currents and water movement to bring food to them. So that includes sponges and, and corals um, as uh, our, our animals that are, are use suspension feeders. Active uh, suspension feeders, on the other hand, create their own currents. So they're pulling in water or not, uh, or, or somehow cur creating currents um, past their feeding uh, uh, apparatus to, uh, to harvest food. And that includes, you know, you can see here, many polychaetes, worms, and bivalves um, do this type of feeding. So uh, what's happening here is, is, is analogous to what we saw already for the filtering feeding zooplankton, in that the particles are caught by these uh, hair-like structures. And the word that's used here is cilia, not cita. These, these are a bit coarser than what we saw for the zooplankton. But again, um, the same type of physics are involved in that the particles um, that are caught are, 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 are even smaller than what you would think would be caught if you looked at only the distance between the, the uh, cilia. And that's again because the, the environment here is a low Reynolds number environment. And the water at this uh, small uh, scale, which is you know, microns and at, uh, is, is, is at the micron scale, um, is, is more like molasses. It's very viscous um, uh, at, at that scale. 
And so these particles um, are trapped much more easily than one, what you expect if you just look only at the distance between these, these uh, cilia. So that's the suspension feeding. Um, now, one question that comes up is, is whether there's any selection um, by suspension feeders. So as we talk about for the zooplankton, you kind of know the answer already. The, the answer base is, is mainly size, that these organisms are filtering out uh, particles of a particular size. But as we saw with the zooplankton, the question comes up is whether they can do some selection as well. And that is, um, would there be any selection of, uh, of say, a high uh, quality particle, uh, alga, for example, as opposed to a low quality piece of detritus, you know, if they are the same size? Um, so if we think about this in comparison to deposit feeders, going, going back to these organisms that are feeding um, at the bottom, um, uh, you know, through, going through uh, the sediments, um, there's no mechanism. There doesn't seem to be any way. And arguably, they don't need it. Um, so what they're doing, you know, here's the, the uh, sea cucumber. They're basically going through a lot of sediment. Um, and depending, and they're, and they're kind of uh, relying on just the quality and the, the quantity of things that they're processing to get enough high quality food. Now, think of that in, in contrast to the suspension feeder. You have these guys waving out their appendices there, and they're trying to uh, you know, collect things in, in their um, cilia to get particles that they can feed and eat. Um, but they can't. Uh, they can't um, afford to have that all clogged up by things that it's low quality. So it seems like there would be more selection for, um, you know, I shouldn't use selection, but the more, there are more advantages to, to be uh, selective in what you eat if you're a suspension feeder as opposed to a, a deposit feeder. And that seems to be the case. The question then becomes the mechanism. Um, and we talked a little bit about um, about selection by chemical cues. And here, what, by mechanism, what we're really talking about is where um, uh, uh, the selection actually occurs and what part of the animal um, actually does it. And, and we get, I guess, back up and say, does it happen at all? And as you may guess, yes, the answer is yes. So the experiment was to, and here again is a case of where the actual outcome of the experiment is perhaps less important than thinking about how they did it. Um, and so I'd be more, you know, uh, I hate to talk about you know, what's going to be on the test, but a good question on a test would be, you know, thinking about an experiment to test this idea about whether they can distinguish between particles of the same size or not. So in, in this case, the experiment was to feed um, this oyster um, algae that are about 20 microns in size, and then also um, the uh, particles that were uh, about that same size, but basically were just cellulose, you know, just little bits of, of grass. Um, cellulose is, again, the structural uh, polysaccharide that makes up the cell walls, not only of algae, but, um, but higher plants as well. And algae, though, um, in addition to having those cell walls, would have a lot of protein and, and other things that make them more nutritious than just um, cellulose. So these or these these uh, uh, low quality particles were stained um, with a red stain, so they, they could be seen. Now the hypothesis was that um, that the particle selection would occur at the palps. So the palps are these like appendices right near the mouth of the of the animal, and so you can see here's here's the mouth, and so these are these uh, lips that are look like kind of appendix appendices that are right. Uh, next to the um, appendages, <laughs> I've been saying appendices, Appendage, appendages right next to the mouth of the animal um, that were thought to be the place where, where food was selected. And is that the case? So that was the experiment. So the experiment in, in, consisted of looking at for the, uh, what was happening to these low uh, uh, quality particles um, they were stained red, and they were actually looked at by a, a, a endoscope um, connected up to a recorder. And an endoscope, um, uh, you know, is basically a small, uh, very small camera. Um, uh, and the experiment was done by by Evan Ward. And uh, one reason why I'm mentioning this is because Evan 
got his, his PhD here at the University of Delaware um, with Nancy Target. Nancy Target was the, uh, before she was uh, president of, of the University of Delaware, acting president for a year, um, she was a professor down here in Lewis um, and um, worked on, actually she's more of a chemical ecologist than some of the things that Evan worked on here. But um, anyway, Evan was a student of hers here and now is a professor at the University of Connecticut. And, and I believe this work was done while Evan was at the University of Connecticut. And anyway, um, he used this endoscope to uh, basically stick this camera into the poor oyster to see how it was feeding. And endoscope um, uh, is actually also used uh, to look at our own digestive tract. And I've had the uh, pleasure of having this stuck down at either ends of my di di digestive tract to see what's going on. And, um, and uh, uh, so anyway, that's, that's a common um, uh, tool in biomedicine to look at what's happening within our own uh, our own bodies and it was applied here to look at what was happening with this oyster and here's what was seen now unfortunately this was done this picture is from um, a middle of not oyster um, uh, but it, it shows the idea and basically the which seen here is the the uh, the separation of what was happening with the uh, the uh, cellulose particles which are not high have high nutrition and they are the ones that are staying red and they're shown all going down this ventral tract um, where they are uh, kind of uh, all collected and excreted by, uh, by the muscle. And here's a diagram just showing that. And the, and the experiments, so that's, this is a, of a gill. And so already before you, the uh, particles were even reaching the, uh, the uh, palps, they're um, uh, being uh, selected and, and there was some uh, uh, selection happening before they reach the palps at the gill. Um, and so, and this is what was basically happening. The, uh, the uh, ventral tract is where these low particle, low um, uh, quality particles were being uh, selected for and, and, and moved over to the ventral tract in which they, in, after which they're eventually just kind of ejected uh, from the animal versus the high quality particles were, were, uh, uh, shunted along the basal tract, and they were brought to the um, the palps for uh, uh, some selection as well as happens there, uh, but uh, a lot of those happening at the gill. So that's that's a more detail than you re need to really know about how oysters and other bivalves filter. Um, and as I had mentioned, um, the more important points to be gained from this. Are, uh, are that first of all there is selection that these or organisms are not relying solely on on, uh, on particle size in choosing what they eat uh, but they also rely on other cues that are somehow telling them that that uh, uh, some particles of the same size are good to eat others are not so good to eat and the other general um, uh, uh, thing to learn from this is just to experiment with the techniques and I would say the ingenuity um, in applying um, this this uh, endoscope that's used in in medicine to um, look at this problem of how these bivalves um, are uh, making this selection in terms of what they eat. So that ends our lecture for today, and um, uh, I can't remember exactly what's happening next. I think we're going to be talking about um, uh, other uh, other invertebrates in other environments.